Joe Biden called for unity among all Americans in his first speech since becoming the vice pres the president elect pardon me there of the United States. Biden has said that his priority was to tackle the coronavirus pandemic and he said that he will be meeting with top scientists to discuss the US covid response. He said that he will come up with a blueprint on the covid response soon. Biden also said that fighting racism was among his priorities. Listen in. On Monday I will name a group of leading scientists and experts as transition advisors to help take the Biden-Harris COVID plan and convert it into an action blueprint that will start on January the 20th, 2021. That plan will be built on bedrock science. It will be constructed out of compassion, empathy, and concern. I will spare no effort, none, or any commitment to turn around this pandemic. The campaign is over. What is the will of the people? What is our mandate? I believe it's this. Americans have called upon us to marshal the forces of decency, the forces of fairness, to marshal the forces of science, and the forces of hope in the great battles of our time, the battle to control the virus, the battle to build prosperity, the battle to secure your family's health care, the battle to achieve racial justice and root out systemic racism in this country, and the battle to save our planet by getting climate under control, The battle to restore decency, defend democracy, and give everybody in this country a fair shot. That's all they're asking for, a fair shot. Former Ambassador to the United States, Arun Singh, is joining us live from New Delhi. Thank you so much for joining us. Could you begin by telling us what this would mean for Joe Biden and Kamala Harris's win would mean for India? I think we can expect uh, that the India-US relationship would continue to consolidate. We found since 2000 that there is a broad bipartisan support in the US for the India relationship. The new phase was started by President Bill Clinton, a Democrat, when he visited India in 2000. And after that, President George Bush, a Republican, did the civil nuclear cooperation agreement with India, which completely transformed the relationship. Subsequently, President uh, Obama, a Democrat, visited India twice in his tenure, which no U.S. president has ever done, and visited India on our Republic Day in 2015. He declared India a major defense partner, and he expressed support for India's permanent membership of UN Security Council. And then President Trump, a very unusual Republican, a maverick in some way, who undermined several of U.S. relationships, but they took the India relationship forward by putting India on strategic trade authorization level one, highest level technology releases meant for friends and closest partners. He visited India in February uh, this year, the last year of his term. Yeah. And last year in September in Houston, he joined the Indian Prime Minister at a rally of 50,000 Indian Americans, which is very unusual for a US president to join a rally for a visiting Indian leader. So one can see that step by step, whichever party comes to power, the relationship has advanced because there is a convergence of interests. And President-elect uh, Biden himself has consistently been supportive of the India relationship. Way back in 2001, as chairman of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, he had written a letter to the then President George Bush asking for removal of sanctions against India. And I remember in 2006, he had given an interview uh, to a news agency uh, where he had said that his dream was that by 2020, the strongest relationship in the world would be the India-US relationship. So we are now at 2020, and he has the opportunity uh, to realize that and take that forward. And on 15th August this year, on our Independence Day, uh, a special statement had been issued on his behalf to the Indian-American community, to India, where he had said that he would be fully supportive of India on the issue of cross-border terrorism and other challenges that India faces uh, on its border. And I think we in India can take uh, legitimate and immense pride in the fact that a person of Indian origin, uh, Senator Kamala Harris, has reached the highest position 
that any woman has reached in the United States and certainly any person of Indian origin has done. So I think uh, it's a new era and there is a new basis for further consolidating the relationship. All right, Ambassador Aaron, just for more clarity on that, Prime Minister Modi has congratulated Joe Biden and Kamala Harris. What are the changes now that we can expect with this transition of government? You know, the transition process takes time in the U.S. So right now there's a present elect. Normally by this time, uh, the person who loses the election concedes. And even uh, in 2016, soon after the elections and the trends were clear, Hillary Clinton had called uh, Donald Trump to concede the election. Now, Donald Trump hasn't done that uh, because you know, his personality is such that he always wants to project himself uh, as the best. Uh, the rally at his inauguration was the largest. The economy under him performed the best. So I think personally, he's finding it difficult to make that concession. Uh, but, and uh, there's talk of court processes, but eventually uh, he has to do that. Uh, but, uh, you know, between now and 20th January, when the new president takes over, there's a whole organized process of transition in the U.S. The president-elect sets up a transition team. Uh, they send people to different departments, agencies who interact with the people there, start preparing on various issues. Uh, there is a separate team that starts uh, assessing who could be the nominees in the new administration? Because almost one third and more of top level positions in the US administration will change as the new administration comes in. So there is a lot of preparation required for that. So they will go through that process. Yeah. And of course, in this period, depending on the relationship between President Trump and President elect and how they uh, deal with each other, there could be a phase of uncertainty in the US and how the U.S. responds should there be a moment of crisis, either domestically or internationally. And of course, as you just mentioned, if President Trump, which we know has refused to concede, from an Indian perspective, what do you make of that? You know, it's really for a U.S. to work. That's a U.S. process uh, of uh, the manner in which uh, transition happens. And that particular process doesn't really uh, impact on India. And uh, because, you know, the U.S. system is complicated. Uh, so far, officially results have not really been declared uh, because the official declaration of results takes time. There's counting done, then it is sent to the empowered authorities in each state. And each state has a process of certifying the results. They choose electors who th then vote according to the popular vote. The results of that comes to the U.S. Congress in early January. And the U.S. House of Representatives receives that and issues the final certified and authenticated result of the election. So that process takes time. But based on the trends and other analysis, uh, various media groups make a projection and they've been accurate. And that is accepted as the basis on which things advance. So that's an internal U.S. process. And, um, and uh, from India's perspective, of course, we would hope that uh, U.S. is able to resolve this challenge uh, in a way that um, uh, it uh, consolidates its strength in the international context. Because given the challenges we face, uh, particularly, you know, the challenge from China, challenge related to terrorism, we would certainly benefit uh, from a U.S. that has a stronger presence internationally to push back on some of the challenges that are emerging. All right, Ambassador Aaron, thank you so much for joining us with all those inputs. Thank you.